Hey everyone, welcome to day 10 of our Super Love Storytime, reading The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. So glad you're here if you're watching the replay, yay. I'm glad you're back. And I am so happy to hear from many of you. I'm getting messages about how you're really enjoying having this read out loud and and for me, this has been an amazing experience because um, I'm hearing a lot of new things. So just know that the more you immerse yourself in these kinds of experiences, the more you're able to stretch your consciousness and your space of creation and possibility even greater. And that's truly what I see has been the biggest success strategy in my life is that I continue to be open to being open to being open to new ways of serving my dreams and creating new dreams and not um, limiting myself. So here we go. We're going to jump in to the next, they call it book. Um, Uh-oh, I need my readers. Okay. So we are in what's called book three. So let's see what that is. Um, book three. Okay. Nice. Ooh, I already like the sounds of this. Okay. This, this little section is called Angels in the Abstract. The next few chapters are going to be about those invisible psychic forces that support and sustain us in our journey towards ourselves. I plan on using terms like muses and angels. Does that make you uncomfortable? If it does, you have my permission to think of angels in the abstract. Consider these forces as being impersonal as gravity. Maybe they are. It's not hard to believe, is it? that a force exists in every grain and seed to make it grow, or that in every kitten or colt is an instinct that impels it to run and play and learn. Just as resistance can be thought of as personal, I've always said resistance loves such and such or hates such and such. It can also be viewed as a force of nature, as impersonal as entropy or molecular decay. Similarly, the call to growth can be conceptualized as personal. Damon or genius, an angel or a muse, or as impersonal, like the tides or transiting of Venus. Either way works, as long as we're comfortable with it. Or if extra dimensionality doesn't sit well with you in any form, Think of it as talent programmed in our genes by evolution. The point for the thesis I'm seeking to put forward is that there are forces we can call our allies. As resistance works to keep us from becoming who we were born to be, equal and opposite powers are counterpoised against it. These are our allies and angels. Okay. I'm excited. Are you? I love it. I love it. I love tapping into the forces beyond. And when you can acknowledge that there's so much magic in the world, like how a flower blooms and how, you know, the sun is there at all. I love he said gravity. I mean, the waves, the animals, everything that we know of as just beyond conceiving, having a baby, a baby that is created within us. It's just incredible. And so, wow. Anyway, approaching the mystery. Why have I stressed professionalism so heavy in the preceding chapters? Because the most important thing about art is to work. Nothing else matters except sitting down every day and trying. Why is this so important? Because when we sit down day after day and keep grinding, something mysterious starts to happen. A process is set in motion by which inevitably and infallibly heaven comes to our aid. 
Unseen forces enlist in our cause. Serendipity reinforces our purpose. Mm. This is the other secret that real artists know and wannabe writers don't. When we sit down each day and do our work, mm. power concentrates around us. The muse takes note of our dedication. She, she approves. We've learned, we've earned favor in her sight. When we sit down and work, we become like a magnetized rod that attracts iron filings. Mm. Ideas come, insights accreate. Just as resistance has its seat in hell, so creation has its home in heaven. And it's not just a witness, but an eager and active ally. What I call professionalism, someone else might call the artist's code or the warrior's way. It's an attitude of egolessness and service. The knights of the round table were chaste and self-effacing, yet they dueled the dragons. We're facing dragons too fire-breathing griffins of the soul, whom we must outfight and outwit to reach the treasure of our self in potential and to release the maiden who is God's plan and destiny for ourselves and the answer to why we are put on this planet. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my favorite part so far. Day 10 is my favorite part so far. Oh my gosh. Have you ever heard that though? Like really you take one step forward and the universe has a step, a leap that's beyond that in support of us. So remember that, you know, really we are always supported. We're not separate from that. And when you have, this is a self-concept thing. When you have the self-concept and what that means is how you view yourself, what you've decided about yourself, what you've decided about yourself in the world that you live in. When you have the self-concept that you live in a benevolent universe, that things are working out for you, that the universe has your back, and that even when things in the 3D look funky, that you are always on course that's such a freeing experience. So what have you decided? And there's also the sense like, oh, that I could go on and on. We're just going to keep going. That might have to be a, a, a completely different series. Speaking of series, I was thinking of doing a series for us. This would probably be a paid experience, but a class for people so that we could tap into actually cultivating our happiness, something called Your Happy You, a series where, you know, ultimately when we can practice what they're talking about here, basically on the regular and be in that, anything is possible, your relationship, anything. So actually speaking of that, the relationship piece, if you're single and you heard what I just read, consider that in the way that your steps forward in claiming your love story in at putting yourself like consciously and with with actual reverence putting yourself on an online site being very clear about who you are and what you want and actually doing it i don't call like throwing up a half-ass profile and a couple pictures and then just you know hoping something happens I don't call that actually reverence. It's like when you bring the energy, the consciousness and the care that you would like to have in a relationship to the process of finding a relationship, that is one of those exact things that then the energy of the cosmos can step in and support you in that, that journey. And if you're in the middle of it and you're doubting that, I will have a video for you shortly because as soon as you go into the doubt, then that's where you are. You're no longer in faith. So it's really a doubt free zone. Anyway, let's keep going. Invoking the muse. The quote from Xenophon that opens this section comes from a pamphlet called the Calvary Commander. 
in which the celebrated warrior and historian proffers instruction to those young gentlemen who aspire to be officers of the Athenian equestrian court. He declares that the commander's first duty before he mucks out a stable or seeks funding from the defense review board is to sacrifice to the gods and invoke their aid. I do the same thing. The last thing I do before I sit down to work is say my prayer to my muse. I say it out loud in absolute earnest. That's a good word, in absolute earnest. Only then do I get down to business. In my late 20s, I rented a little house in Northern California. I had gone there to finish a novel or kill myself trying. By that time, I had blown up a marriage to a girl I loved with all my heart, screwed up two careers, blah, 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 all because though I had no understanding of this at the time, I could not handle resistance. I had one novel nine-tenths of the way through, the other 99 hundredths before I threw them in the trash. I couldn't finish them. I didn't have the guts. In yielding thusly to resistance, I fell prey to every vice, evil, distraction, you name it, mentioned heretofore, all leading nowhere. And finally, washed up in this sleepy California town with my Chevy van, my cat Mo, and my antique Smith Corona. A guy named Paul Rink lived down the street. Look him up. He's in Henry Miller's big star in the oranges of Hieronymus Bosch. Paul was a wire writer. He lived in his camper, Moby Dick. I started each day over coffee with Paul. He turned me on to all kinds of authors I'd never heard of before, lectured me on self-discipline, dedication, the evils of the marketplace. But best of all, he shared with me his prayer the invocation of the muse from Homer's Odyssey, the T.E. Lawrence translation. Paul typed it out for me on his even more ancient than mine manual, Remington. I still have it. It's yellow and parched as dust. The merest puff would blow it into powder. In my little house, I had no TV. I never read a newspaper or went to a movie. I just worked. One afternoon, I was banging away in the little bedroom I had converted into an office when I heard my neighbor's radio playing outside. Someone in a loud voice was declaiming, to pers um, persevere, protect, defend the Constitution of the United States. And I came out. What's going on? Didn't you hear? Nixon's out. They got a new guy in there. I had missed Watergate completely. I was determined to keep working. I had failed so many times and caused myself and people I love so much pain, thereby that I felt if I crapped out this time, I would have to hang myself. I didn't know what resistance was then. No one had schooled me on the concept. I felt it though, big time. I experienced it as a compulsion to self-destruct. Okay, how many of you have had that? And I'll tell you, when you ask, I'm just gonna keep saying, when you're asking for something, you will receive it. But if you're asking for something and then going into doubt and letting all of these dragons and trolls and inner critics and fears and overwhelm and confusion and, you know, sickness and everything distract you, then, then you're slowing it down or killing it. I experienced this compulsion to self-destruct. I could not finish what I started. The closer I got, the more different ways I'd find to screw it up. I worked for 26 months straight, taking only two out for a stint of migrant labor in Washington State. And finally, one day I got to the last page and typed out the end. I never did find a buyer for the book or the next one either. It was 10 years before I got the first check for something I had written, 10 more before a novel. The Legend of Bagger Vance was actually published. By that moment, when I first hit the keys to spell out VN, it was epic. I remember rolling the last page out and adding it to the stack that was the finished manuscript. manuscript. Nobody knew I was done. Nobody cared, but I knew. 
I felt like a dragon I'd been fighting all my life had just dropped dead at my feet and gasped out its last sulfuric breath. Rest in peace, motherfucker. That's awesome. Next morning, I went over to Paul's for coffee and told him I had finished. Good for you, he said without looking up. Start the next one today. Love it. Okay, so we have Invoking the Muse Part 2. Before I met Paul, I had never heard of the Muses. He enlightened me. The Muses were nine sisters, daughters of Zeus and Memephs of Israel, which means memory. Their names are Cleo, Arado, Thalia, Timbusa, Timbusa, Bzzza, na 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 na. There's very complicated names. Sorry. Their job is to inspire artists. Each muse is responsible for a different art. There's a neighborhood in New Orleans where the streets are named after the muses. I lived there once and I had no idea. I thought they were just weird names. Here's Socrates and Plato's Phaedrus on the noble of incent madness. Ooh, okay, here's a clip from Socrates. The third type of possession and madness is possession by the muses. When this seizes upon a gentle and virgin soul, it rouses it to inspired expression in lyric and other sorts of poetry and glorifies countless deeds of the heroes of old for the instruction of posterity. But if a man comes to the door of poetry untouched by the madness of the muses, believing that technique alone will make him a good poet, he and his sane compositions never reach perfection, but are utterly eclipsed by the performances of the inspired madman. The Greek way of apprehending the mystery was to personify it. The ancients sensed powerful primordial forces in the world. To make them approachable, they gave them human faces. They called them Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite. American Indians felt the same mystery, but rendered it in anim animistic forms, bear, teacher, hawk, messenger, coyote, trickster. Uh, our ancestors were keenly cognizant of the forces and energies whose seat was not in this material sphere, but in a loftier, more mysterious one. What did they believe about this higher reality? First, they believed that death did not exist there. The gods are immortal. The gods, though not unlike humans, are infinitely more powerful. To defy their will is futile. To act towards heaven with pride is to call down calamity. Time and space display an altered existence in this higher dimension. The gods travel swift as thought. They can tell the future. Some of them, and though the playwright Agathon tells us, this alone is denied to God, the power to undo the past. Oh. Yet the immortals can play tricks with time, as we ourselves may sometimes in dreams or visions. The universe the Greeks believed was not indifferent. The gods take an interest in human affairs and intercede for good or ill in our designs. The contemporary view is that all this is charming, but preposterous, is it? The answer, this. Where did Hamlet come from? Where did the Parthenon come from? Where did noon descending a staircase come from? Awesome. Okay, I think we're going to stop there for today. But I do want to say, how fun is this to actually get a sense of our ancestors personifying the muses? And what do you get to have? Because imagine, like I was just imagining collecting all that our ancestors knew, all the wisdom of the invisible, all of the the muses, the entities, the beings, the unicorns, the fairies, the dragons, all of it, like all of it, all of that, angels, whatever you believe in, whatever you don't, maybe you get to choose to like have that in your life right now. Like what can you 
acknowledge right here and now, like even just being aware of all of the forces, the energies, the molecules, the, the beings that are present. You can even take a moment to imagine and sense and perceive those circles of support around you. It may be new to you right now. It may be like, wow, as you spoke those words, now I'm aware that, yeah, there are all these beings. I don't, you don't need to know who they are. You don't need to know exactly what they're doing, but just being aware of all of the circles of support that are in the invisible realm. And it may feel like space. You may even have sensations in your bodies. But right now, just acknowledge that. And anywhere where you are not receiving, anywhere where you may have barriers up, just ask all of that to, to lower, to melt away. And invite your being to open up to receive this greater support. And only you know what that is. I mean, we just read about, you know, Native Americans, um, Greeks, and in the way that they put labels on it. But that's theirs. You get to have that and everything that you know. And get have fun with that. Like, you can go in your journal, let yourself, let your imagination reveal to you all of the different muses that come through you. And keep in mind, your imagination is the access to the muse. Your imagination is that channel. So if you're like, wow, I just got a sense of an angel or a fairy. Oh, you could go, oh, well, I'm just making that up. That's weird. No, receive it. That's not make, you don't make anything up. Your imagination is actually a channel of wisdom, inspiration, divine guidance, and let yourself have this. Maybe you do it as an art project. Maybe you do it as a journaling. Maybe you do it some other way, but do it because there's so much support here that whatever it is that you are asking for, and maybe you're aware of it right now, what is that thing you're asking for? Say, you know, hey, muses, hey, beings, hey, divine team, will you help me? Like, I would love your help. You can just start asking and having that dialogue. I would love your help with this. Thank you. Oftentimes, it's just making that statement and letting your body be aware of this greater support space that can change so much. It will change a lot. So let yourself do that. If you're looking for a love relationship, say, hey, who wants to be Cupid's? Yes, thank you. I'm so grateful now that you're you're supporting me. I love this. I'm so excited to have my person because I know it's coming. If you're starting a new business endeavor and you're wanting to grow that, you'll be like, oh, show me new opportunities, new people, new possibilities, new clients. How exciting is that? So, all right. Good job, everyone. Reach out to me if you would like to Get your own support, one-on-one -on -one support with me. I'm going to be opening the doors to that in probably a couple months. So it's still wait list time, but um, I'm excited to work with more people on creating that super loved life. So let's have a conversation and we can see what wants to happen for you. All right. Thank you. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye.